and welcome to FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you into this broadcast this evening with great thanks as always to Do I still keep I'm a good Brian? I'm sorry. We're dealing with a little bit of delay here, and it's being just a little bit uh aggravating. And I think I'm I think I'm gonna have to mute that screen, Brian, or it's gonna throw me off here. Okay. All righty. And we're very thankful to welcome all of you to the Sunday Night Live on FOJC Radio Rumble Channel. And tonight we have a very, very important broadcast on the spiritual deception of Mormonism. We're so very thankful for each and every one of you joining us for this broadcast. And it's going to be very, very spiritually refreshing and enlightening. And we have a very special guest tonight. Uh, as always, we're very thankful for Brian Reese, the host of FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live on the Rumble Channel. And we have a very special guest tonight, Mr. Eric Cromwell. And he is very studied in Mormonism, and he also has life experience with the issue of Mormonism. So, Eric, we want to welcome you to FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. Well, good evening. And, uh, uh, I guess some of the main things that I just want to make sure uh, are hit on is uh, where in some areas it may seem like we're validating Mormonism. Um, there, there is reason to uh, reason to do so, but not theologically. And just wanted to, uh, I guess, in this broadcast, point out some of the theological differences between uh, uh, proper biblical understanding and and Mormon theology. Um, there will be one video that'll be shown that, uh, we just want to be clear is, uh, nothing, nothing in it is biblical. Um, and yeah, just to be clear that it is completely different and, um, where many may mistakenly think that Mormonism may be a, uh, or the LDS church is a branch of, or a denomination of Christianity is far from. Um, I just wanted to get some of those clear points in there. And we're going to be taking a little bit different, well, a totally different approach from what people would take in apologetic against Mormonism. And I think it's fair to say that when most Christian apologists deal with Mormonism, they would say that the Book of Mormon is total fairy tales and just made up nonsense and there's a little of that in there but we're going to be showing you that there is a factual basis to some of the elements of the book of mormon and the pearl of great price and we're going to be showing you the origin of that and i think this is going to be extremely insightful for our lds friends it's going to help them to see and understand the spiritual dynamic that's really in play in the books that they have entrusted, the books and the organization that they have entrusted their eternal salvation to. And we're going to begin with a cartoon. Yes, we're going to have about a six-minute cartoon. And this cartoon was actually banned by the LDS Church, and it was done by Jeremiah Films. And it's about six minutes long, and we're going to play this at the beginning of the broadcast here, the entire six minutes of this band cartoon. And it does an amazingly good job of communicating the basic tenets of Mormonism. And the average person has no idea what the Mormon church believes or is actually all about. Is there something you'd like to say about this cartoon before we play it here, Eric? Well, uh, not about the cartoon, but I know that uh, there might be some confusion, and I'll just clear it up that uh, the words Mormon, LDS, Latter-day Saints, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are can be are going to be mentioned throughout this broadcast, and uh, they all mean the same thing. Um, the Mormon Church, LDS Church, Latter-day Saints, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they're, they're just different terminology for the exact same thing. And I think today that 
those folks like to be called LDS. Is that right? Instead they of prefer to be well. Uh, the new thing is fully spelled out: uh, uh, Latter Day Saints or Latter Day Saints of the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, and I, I, I'll say that I tend to steer away from that just a little bit, only because I personally don't want to give uh, uh, credence to them being saints when when they're we're not so much right so um no offense to any uh lds individuals um but just to put that out there uh so all right yeah well, we're, we're going to i'm going to have brian and then after the cartoon brother brian is going to uh come into the broadcast here but brian is going to start this six minute cartoon and like we say this cartoon is from jeremiah films and it does a very good job of introducing all of us into the basic things that Mormonism believes that most people have no idea that they believe. Absolutely, David. But before I get started, uh, real quick, next week, me and David are going to be doing a really cool episode. We're going to be doing Clear as Mud, Mud Fossils and Mud Fud. So if anybody's interested in mud flood and all that stuff when it comes into megalithic structures and all these different things throughout the past, me and David's going to take a deep dive next week on the 23rd of July at 9 p.m. Eastern time. So on FLJC night or on FLJC Sunday Night Live radio, rumble here, but just join us. And uh, before, uh, before uh, I just want to say thank you, Eric, for being on here. Um, appreciate you being on here and being a guest. And thank you always, David, for allowing me to uh, do this with you guys. So... We're going to start this cartoon off, and it's a, it's a doozy. It's a doozy, like David says. It's a doozy. So just one moment, guys, and I'll pull it up here for everybody. Let's see. There you go. We are good to go. Here we go, everybody. Regardless of its Christian veneer, the basic tenets of Mormonism are in direct conflict with biblical Christianity. The following piece of animation, based directly on actual Mormon publications, highlights these major doctrinal differences. Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified god and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. Through obedience to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Kola. Here the god of Mormonism and his wives through endless celestial sex produced billions of spirit children. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. Both of Elohim's eldest sons were there. Lucifer and his brother Jesus. A plan was presented to build planet Earth where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus, who would become savior of the planet Earth. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him in revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. Those who remained neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. 
the spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter-skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Early Mormon prophets taught that Elohim and one of his goddess wives came to Earth as Adam and Eve to start the human race. Thousands of years later, Elohim, in human form once again, journeyed to Earth from the starbase Kola, this time to have sex with the Virgin Mary, in order to provide Jesus with a physical body. After Jesus Christ grew to manhood, he took at least three wives, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Through these wives, the Mormon Jesus, for whom Joseph Smith claimed direct descent, supposedly fathered a number of children before he was crucified. According to the Book of Mormon, after his resurrection, Jesus came to the Americas to preach to the Indians who the Mormons believe are really Israelites. Thus, the Jesus of Mormonism established his church in the Americas as he had in Palestine. By the year 421 A.D., the dark-skinned Indian Israelites, known as Lamanites, had destroyed all of the white Nephites in a number of great battles. The Nephites' records were supposedly written on golden plates and buried by Moroni, the last living Nephite in the hill Cumorah. 1,400 years later, a young treasure seeker named Joseph Smith who was known for his tall tales, claimed to have uncovered these same gold plates near his home in upstate New York. He is now honored by Mormons as a prophet because he claimed to have had visions from the spirit world in which he was commanded to organize the Mormon church because all Christian creeds were an abomination. It was Joseph Smith who originated most of these peculiar doctrines which millions today believe to be true. By maintaining a rigid code of financial and moral requirements and through performing secret temple rituals for themselves and the dead, the Latter-day Saints hope to prove their worthiness and thus become gods. The Mormons teach that everyone must stand at the final judgment before Joseph Smith, the Mormon Jesus, and Elohim. Those Mormons who were sealed in the eternal marriage ceremony expect to become polygamous gods in the celestial kingdom, rule over other planets, and spawn new families throughout eternity. Yeah, so... Just for a few seconds here, I want to comment on this, on the video here. Um, wow. And if you look at the time on the animations, I don't know, was it 80s, 70s when this animations was made? I'll uh, see what uh, David and uh, um, uh, Eric have to say about it. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, very, very interesting. First thing that comes to my mind is whenever I was, uh, just recently, me and Brother Dan Badondi, um we do some things on, on the Dan Badoni show and visual disturbance, my channel. We uh, talk about a lot of controversial topics. Uh, one thing that when I was just sitting there watching that, the first thing I thought of was like ascended masters, the ascended masters, uh, all that teaching is so bad for our society. Like I just can't even grasp, but then you could look at this and this Mormonism, uh, band cartoon, why in the world is this even in existence? And these things put little nuggets in your mind and plant bad seed. Like before you know it, it, it detours you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And this had, you know, this could fit the narrative in the bill for the alien narrative that they're trying to set up here in the 2022, 2023. And it just baffles the mind. This is even, this is like seventies, eighties animations. And even everybody that's been alive since then, these are like little subliminal messaging. And it's, I'm not trying to discredit Mormonism or put them down in any way. We're trying to shine a light of how 
how there's a misconception of this is supposed to be, I just can't even imagine going around and saying I'll become a God one day and be able to create planets and create other beings. And it's just, it just baffles the mind. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, David, Eric, how do you all feel about this? Well, what do you, what, what is y'all's commentary on this? This is a very, I mean, it's just, it's hard to grasp the video. I mean, and then a lot of people would think, well, it's just a cartoon. It just told a lot. And that six minutes of footage, it told a lot of the story. And the, it hits it on spot on too. When you start diving into it, it just, uh, it's a little, I, I think these days it's a little embarrassing to the church, but that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, I, I think it tells it's spot on. And I want to be clear to, uh, to also, um, yeah, I, I've been hearing a lot of, uh, testimonies lately about, uh, uh, people who have left the Mormon church and there's, uh, unfortunately us putting this out here right now, right off the bat is already being, uh, uh, uh kind of anticipated to just be Mormon bashing, which I, I appreciate you saying that it, it that we're not. Uh, we're, we're not just trying to tear down someone's faith and leave them in the dark with nothing. And that's kind of what, uh, what so many other um, uh, uh, anti-Mormon uh, literature groups have been trying to do, and that, that's not what we are trying to do here. Uh, and And what we want to do we want to sincerely challenge our LDS friends to examine the material and the organization that they're trusting their eternal life to. Now, right off the bat, Eric, I noticed something in this video where it talks about trillions of planets and many, many gods. Now, at the offset, if someone was a believer in biblical cosmology, as we have come to believe in with an enclosed system with the heavenly luminaries underneath the firmament, would this not immediately cause us to dismiss this Mormon concept of trillions of planets? That's a bunch in it. True. Yes. Uh, it would. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly enough, it's of course not one of the uh, main things, the missionary first things the missionary is going to talk to you about, but yes, when you're when you're looking at the uh, pre-creation part of their story, um, yeah, just knowing true biblical, well, the truth in the cosmology, you do understand that uh, well, this 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 is already not sounding right. Yeah, it. Uh... Okay, all right, it will go. Now, there's another really um, radical concept here that immediately with Bible believers, it's just absolutely off the hook. And this is the fact that Elohim is a created being. And right from the start, here's a big link with Kabbalism. In the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah teaches that Ein Sof created the God of the Bible. Now, this should be, I mean, there's so many red flags here. But the, the very concept that Mormonism teaches that Elohim was created. I mean, this is just really something they should think about. Yeah. Uh, so is the Elohim of Mormonism, um, is he, I, he's not obviously the, the big dog God. So he's, uh, he's, not the creator of all things. He's only the creator of this earth and in, uh, in, in Mormon theology. It's uh, uh, while the uh, true God uh, would be, he's the creator of all things, all universe, time, space, um, uh, whatever is actually fully in the cosmos and to its full degree. It's, it's, you know, uh, and beyond um, uh Anyway, that's clearly we're not talking about the same creator God. So I think I guess it would be fair to say that the God of the Book of Mormon and the God of the Bible are obviously two different gods. True. Two different gods. And 
another one of the concepts we want to talk about. And this really, like Eric said, Eric said that um, most ministries that try to deal with Mormonism, and thank God that they are in whatever degree, that they basically just tear down everything as a lie and leave uh, the LDS folks there just hanging in the wind. But I want to think a little bit about the Book of Mormon and what is correct in it and what is incorrect, and to try to get a little bit of understanding here. And I'm going to have our beloved leader tonight, Brian Reese. Brian is going to throw up a, a slide here of the Hill Kumora. And the Hill Kumora is the place where Joseph Smith originally claimed that the angel Moroni led him to a place where he found a wagon load of golden plates that he translated into the Book of Mormon. Now, would not the obvious uh, approach to this, Eric, to be that this is just a made-up lie? Correct. Uh, so the the common claim out there is that uh, where where is these where are these Mormon plates? Uh, oh, uh, just went treasure hunting on some hill, and interestingly enough, we can't uh, the, the the LDS Church has not done uh, not been permitting an archaeological dig on the Hill Cumorah, even though that's on now that is now on church property. Um, the uh, the claim that's put out there is that uh, oh, what are they worried about? Um, and uh, I, I I would beg to differ. What they're worried about is what actually will be discovered, um, uh, because the common theme out the the common claim from non Mormon sources is that there is no archaeological evidence to support the Book of Mormon the way that there is archaeological evidence to support the Bible. Uh, it's it's Whether or not you believe the Bible is uh, is true as far as its uh, religious, uh, spiritual claims, um, it is very much more harder to, to, to argue that it's uh, uh, not a um, uh, historically sound as far as uh, most of its archaeological backup. Is it a historical reference, and, and and where you can claim that the where you can see that the Bible can clearly add up to that? Um, uh, the claim is out there that there is no archaeological evidence to support the claims of the Book of Mormon, and therefore it must all be uh, uh, fairy tale and thrown out. Um, uh, but with many of the different things that are coming to light now, um, you got the History Channel even thrown out uh, through through its ancient aliens theories that um all the various archaeological evidence that supports uh that goes against the mainstream narrative and what i started to notice is that wow all those things match up perfectly with the book of mormon and i think as things come on as, as the as the system as it's come to be starts to break down and people become even more or less trusting in it the true facts that are out there are going to some are, are going to start matching up with the Book of Mormon, and that's going to lead a lot more people to Mormonism. Um, but there is, but as we wanted to clearly lay out from the from the get go, is that um, uh, Mormonism and Christianity are two solely opposite viewpoints, um, and uh, and and to not fall into that trap because that I don't know if I'm hitting this all right, but that's yeah, yeah, and I believe. And I'm going to get ready to throw it to you, Brother Brian, here in just a minute and let you talk about these slides. But I firmly believe that there was a fallen angel that led Joseph Smith to this Indian mound. This is an Indian mound and that he did find some genuine plates and that Mr. Smith took that fallen angel knowledge. And Tracy Vene and I, we did a broadcast on the Olmecs. And we quoted from sections of the Book of Mormon that was specifically telling the Olmec story after the dispersion of Babel. It was absolutely, undeniably accurate. And I believe that a fallen angel led Mr. Smith there, that there were some real tablets with some real knowledge, and that with that, Mr. Smith has mixed in a little Freemasonry, a little of his little bit of made-up stuff to form a religion whereby he could control and have power over people. But I'm going to throw it to you, my friend, Brian, for you to show some of these slides and that are just absolutely amazing. 
Yeah, so the the whole Joseph Smith connection with Kamara. So you've hit the nail on the head, David. Um, it's interesting. There was supposedly reports of these golden tablets. These golden, they was in a gold color. Uh, they was weighing from 30 to 60 pounds and composed with thin metallic pages engraved with hieroglyphics on it, right? So, you know, I was talking to you before the broadcast, you know, the hieroglyph, no, excuse me, Egyptian hieroglyphics. So if you got uh, on both sides, so there's hieroglyphics on both sides that bound with a three, literally spelling out the word three, and then a D shape, and it's rings, 3D shape rings. Well, supposedly the whole narrative with uh, Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith uh, found these two plates on September 22nd, not, or excuse me, 1823, on a hill near his home in Manchester, New York. And this is what you just said a while ago, and we're, gonna, we're just going to bring this home. After the angel, Marana, directed him to a burial stone box, he said the angel prevented him from taking the plates, but instructed him to return to the same location in a year. He returned to the site every year, but he, or, but it was not until September of 1827 that he recovered the plates on his fourth annual attempt to retrieve them. He returned home with a heavy object wrapped in a frock, that's F-R-O-C-K, which he then put in a box. He allowed others to... Uh, heft the box but said that the angel had forbidden him to show the plates to anyone until they had been translated okay so here's the interesting here's where it's gonna get really good so the translation from the their origin the original reformed egyptian language so here we go we got egyptian hieroglyphics here smith de uh, dedicated the text of the plates while a scribe wrote down the words would later become the book of mormon eyewitnesses uh said that Smith translated the plates not by looking directly at them, okay? Not directly looking at them like me and you would just read a book or, a, you know, just a rock um, or anything, uh, but by looking through a transparent sear, sear, S-E-E-R, stone in the bottom of his hat. And then supposedly, here we go, Smith published the first edition of the translation in March of 1830 as the Book of Mormon, with a print run of 5,000 copies at the production cost of $3,000, and it came out to be $0.60 cents per book. So we definitely have some compelling information here. We're looking at Fallen Angel narrative. We got even the gold tablets. Even We're talking about New York here, so we shouldn't have Egyptian uh, tablets sitting here, right? So then he has this supposedly seer stone that's actually transparent to be able to... Uh, basically turn it into an English language, then implement it in the Book of Mormon. So y'all riddle that off to me and see what y'all, I mean, literally we're looking at principalities, Ephesians 6 verse 12 here. We're looking at things of an angelic attribute. And like I said, after I comment, commented off of that video, when you're saying Lucifer and Jesus are our brothers, and then when you get into this whole narrative of like ascension and everything and being able to become a little G God and have all these worlds, you know, this billions of worlds and be able to inhabit them because you was good, you was good in this so-called religion and you swore your allegiance to the Book of Mormons. All I'm seeing is a deflection to stay away from the true word of God, like Eric said earlier and it diverts you away from it and then before you know it you're following angels instead of following jesus christ and i want to know what y'all have to say about that because that that right there can just we can sit right all day and talk about the golden tablets and even from my research i find many 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 even up the east coast of america and down my way where there's tablets they're not they're not gold but they do with resurrection and immortality and all kinds of we could go down a big rabbit hole but that's not for the sake of this video but i want to hear y'all's thoughts on that david uh, you're hitting all this spot on and uh i i'm honestly um i'm honestly thrilled to just say that you're seeing you're seeing exactly what i've been trying to have people see is is uh, uh the, the, that there is validity to uh some of the aspects the tangible aspects of the book of mormon or the history thereof um but where is it coming from uh i very much believe it's one coming from another angel 
uh, come into someone with another gospel and another story. And we had been advised um, to stay away from that and let that angel be eternally condemned. Yeah, the now go, go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Well, something that um, is just obvious when you look at this hill Kamora, it's an Indian mound. It's an Indian mound. And the more that we've researched the the Indian uh, Indian mounds as places where there are worship centers that very much tie in with that uh, the old Canaanite of uh, Genesis six worship of the fallen ones. And I know Eric said something to me that I haven't heard anyone else say before. He has been very uh, uh, aware that when the early Mormon explorers went west, that they followed the Indian mounds. And there you can mm -hmm. see the that's the Hill Camorra. It's an Indian mound. Mm -hmm. And more than that, there's an entire complex of a worship center around this Hill Camorra. But that was a something i'd never heard before eric when you were talking about when the mormon pioneers went west they followed the mounds that's i i, I haven't dove, dove dove in enough to uh to see where the mounds were at and all their stopping points but that is my current theory that uh it, it would certainly would appear so um i find it interesting though uh when they're sent further west um there's uh where they came out of the rocky mountains after the uh uh, 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 basically having a very hard winter and hanging out with the uh, 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 the Dahmer party. Um, the uh, They were looking down upon the Salt Lake Valley and uh, uh, noted out that this is the place. And um, uh, after spending some time in that area too, it, it's there are certain aspects of it that just seem to be you start digging around it, it it starts to feel like this is the place of what you know that something that there's something deeper and i just right now it's just a feeling but uh it's that there's something more to it i think that yeah i think there's an undeniable connection between uh mormonism the the fallen angel knowledge and this mound culture that was worshiping um, in this serpent religion. Now, one of the more bizarre, and I want to say also because of the nature of this broadcast, if anyone in the chat has a question that you would like to ask Eric, uh, you shoot that to Brian, and Brian is going to uh, get that over here so Eric can respond to that. So many things, and I, I think that another thing the LDS is purposely trying to do, they want to present themselves as another basically evangelical Christian denomination. And they try to keep these more exotic and bizarre beliefs of uh, hidden from the mainstream people. I know I have talked to people in Evansville that went to the LDS church there. They had never heard of the planet Kolob, but talk to us just a little bit, uh, Eric, here about this planet Kolob and this bizarre belief that the Mormons maintain about Kolob. Oh, honestly, as far as the, uh, as far as I understand, the mass majority, the, really the, it, it was a, there is a particular star allegedly out there that, uh, that that is where Kolob is, uh, is said to be. Um, yeah, I think you had the reference at one point, but the, um, uh, the, oh man, I just had a thought on that. I lost it. The, um, uh wow here in the pearl of great price thank you it talks about and this is the pearl of great price and if we would look at the authoritative mormon documents it would be the book of mormon doctrine and covenants and pearl of great price that would be their three big ones and here there's a seal here that's really bizarre this is one that uh, joseph smith claimed that he retrieved from this the Indian mound there. And it says here, and this is in the book of Abraham in the third chapter. And the explanation of this uh, piece of uh, hieroglyphic, I guess, that Mr. Smith recovered is that it represents Kolob signifying the first creation to the celestial residence of God. And in the book of Abraham, the third chapter, it talks about this planet Kolob. 
And it's interesting that if you look at the Jehovah Witnesses, they say that their God came from the Pleiades. And they both have a real giveaway here that the entity they're talking about that is having endless sex on this planet Kolob, you know, this reminds me very much of uh, the planet Krypton and stuff like this. This is just so far from biblical Christianity and biblical revelation that that this should be immediately discernible. This is a huge red flag. Uh, clearly, it's uh, uh, it's coming from something that's already created too. Uh, so therefore, he is not the creator of Kolob, um, and therefore not the creator of the cosmos. Um, and the uh, what I was trying to remember earlier is is the thought that um, uh, uh, proper authentic Mormon understanding is, uh, does not believe that God is um, omniscient. Ob omniscient. Am I saying that right? Omniscient. Yes, omniscient. Sure. Um, and therefore, uh, he can only be at one place at one time. Um, mm. uh, and unlike the, well, a, a true creator uh, can certainly be anywhere he desires. He, he is everywhere. He is. Uh, and, well, I, I can interject if you don't mind, guys. Uh, speaking of Kumar, they, uh, Kumara, the also just want to mention, you know, the hill that we're mentioning here, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it here in a minute, about the Indian male narrative, but uh, you mentioned it a minute ago, Eric, with the it's literally called the the hill and which is a land of many waters rivers and fountains okay so when you look at all this and you just mentioned the angels and stuff like that we're talking about this um the first thing that comes to mind and i looked up the east coast and delaware area and everything but the Alleghenies, they they talk about these beings come out of the water i looked at the niagara falls narrative beings come out of the water and then we looking at the kumara today on the FOJC here, lands and many waters, rivers, and fountains. And that's every time you, you two was talking about they traveled and they used the mounds as basically a map. And I've said this forever, you know, the constellations and the way the land masses are made, it's like a huge puzzle piece of mapping. And the Indians knew it. Uh, Americans knew it at one period of time, but we don't know anymore. <laughs> it's been hidden, but I wanted to bring that up, that this place has, it's called the land of many waters, rivers, and fountains. And that one just baffles my mind. You know, it's just, because you said that, you know, you can't be everywhere. So it makes you wonder if the tales that I've been listening, reading, and researching with the Indians, they talk about these creatures and beings coming out of the water. It just, it, it and they're always Indian mounds or a little tiny, you know, like a prehistoric village or everything that's close by. In proximity and i think we're looking at this you know where this book of mormon uh gold plates with joseph smith i think it fits the profile mm -hmm. it absolutely does it would make sense as above so below if we have the mounds that we know are laid out with uh in relationship to the heavenly uh the heavenly luminaries it's just like a map the map the mounds become a map that is discernible from observing the heavens but in, if you think about it, in the biblical definition of idolatry in Romans 1, it's worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And when they believe that their God has created, every aspect of the worship of their created God is a worship of the creation and not the creator. And even in the little, uh, the little plate here, that is in the book of Abraham. They even have a little gravage, graven image of the father there. So, you know, this is just obviously not true biblical worship, but it is an idolatrous strain. Now, something else, Eric, that really uh, is just one of these more exotic Mormon beliefs is this aspect of Lucifer and Jesus being brothers. Yeah. Uh -huh. um... Now, the more I uh, the more I look at it, the uh, the more it reminds me of uh, today's uh, Marvel portrayal of Thor and Loki. Um, the uh, the Norse goddess, or, I'm sorry, Norse god mindset, the uh, the hero versus the villain, um, and uh, uh, I think that that is exactly what we have here. I think we have a mixture. We we have a combination of a um, Norse uh, god. Um, theology 
kind of coming together with the ancient Mesoamerican uh, type of stories. Um, uh, and I don't know if you want to uh, hit on the um, the idea of uh, uh, Amaru. Would if you want to hit on that one? That's the idea that I don't know. It, in the Book of Mormon, there's the story of, uh, of Jesus descending um, uh, after his supposedly his ascension. Um, uh, he descended on the Americas, and um, yeah, that, that that and it fits right in with a Native American, uh, multiple Native American sources. Um, and what David is pulling up here is actually uh, uh, what, what he's. I, I'll leave you to leave you to it well i just have a couple of quotes here to back up what you're saying you know uh tracy and i when we did the presentation on the olmecs we brought out the fact that the mormons believed that quetacultzel was jesus and that jesus is quetacultzel instead of saying that the book of mormon is the testament of, an of another testament of jesus christ it's more correctly said, the testament of another Jesus. This is a quote from uh, a book called Christ in America by Milton R. Hunter. He was a member of the First Council of the Seventy, and he says this, Quetacotzel could have been none other than Jesus the Christ, the Lord and God of this earth and the Savior of the human family. Thus, Jesus Christ and Quetacotzel are identical. John Taylor, who was the president and prophet of the LDS Church in 1882, he said the story of the life of the Mexican divinity Quetacotzel closely resembles that of the Savior, so closely indeed that we can come to no other conclusions than that Quetacotzel and Christ are the same being. The Word of God tells us in the 96th Psalm that the gods of the nations are idols. This is idolatry. This is dangerous. We have a wrong God. The God of Mormonism is definitely not the God of the Bible. And absolutely, I mean, you can be off on some things, thank God, but when you confuse Quetacotzel and Jesus, I mean, that's a 10 on the Richter scale. You don't want to go there. I think Quetacotzel is also, um, I think it's Kolkalkin. I think it's Kolkalkin, I think, it's, and it's derived, I think it's a serpent. And then you got the whole the whole giant narrative, six fingers, six toes, all that stuff. It's it's and then they get into the evil Enoch. I mean, it's it's a rabbit trail, but it it does make sense, I guess, when it comes into the Aztecian culture, like you said, Mexican and Mexico and stuff. It's uh, David. It's pretty it's pretty bad when we're literally referring to Jesus as a, a demonic creature or, or an evil entity. It was large. It had you know different different types of you know. The, not the anatomy of a man, right? Different, different type of attributes. It's 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 mind-boggling, really. It really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's blasphemy. It is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't say anything other than that this is blasphemy, and we just implore our LDS friends. And you know, the Mormonism says that they believe in the Bible as far as it is correctly translated, and when they feel it's not correctly translated, they can bend it to to accommodate what they want to say but in and i have a book here that and eric gave me this book as a matter of fact it has the the book of mormon the doctrine of covenants and pearl of great price all together in one volume with the bible but what we would implore our lds friends to do is to begin to compare the scriptures with the book of mormon and you'll see quickly you have another god another jesus and they are literally trying to blend the dark realm to make it coalesce and fit with that of God. The whole, we have all of it. We have the uh, the the false savior. We have the fallen angels made to be good. The whole thing is, is just coming out all upside down and wonky. Yeah, the, the uh, let me know when you want to show the Google Earth imagery of uh, Kamara, if you, whenever you want me to show that, because that would really, we'll do that toward the end of the broadcast, however you feel, David, and uh, okay, you let me know. Or, or, yeah. 
or just whenever um, uh, Eric would like to do oh, that. Yeah. Just I'm just going along with the flow right now. You guys are actually seeing the stuff I've been trying to have seen. So you, uh, uh, in some cases, I'll just chime in when it's when I think I need to. But go for whatever you got, however you guys think to lay it out. All righty, and you know we, you are our guest this evening. You are our guest, and we appreciate you so much coming on because you've done. I know I was looking at uh, 59 pages of printed material you worked up on Mormonism. Good stuff. It showed a lot of study. And you also uh, have moved this area from Salt Lake. And you have real life experience with uh, the LDS people. And another one of the things that is just a huge red flag that should reveal the spirit behind Mormonism is that which they say about people with black skin. Mm. And this was mentioned in the cartoon. And Eric, if you would just uh, explain this to our listeners a little bit. Well, the uh, uh, allegedly, according to the Mormon story, is that uh, it, now we all apparently, according to them, uh, pre-existed the way we might understand. Like, they... Because Jesus is our elder brother, according to Mormonism, um, uh, his his pre incarnate existence that they would say is the same thing that everybody would have had, um, and in this pre existent existence, I said that right. The um, uh, those who wouldn't uh, wouldn't take a side between uh, standing up with Lucifer, standing up with Jesus, the Mormon Jesus, is uh, uh, those uh, cowards, if you would, would be born with uh, with darker skin. Um, this this would also end up becoming, uh, uh, they would find their places in the, the more villainous type characters within the Bible. They say uh, that the mark of Cain would be uh, black skin. Um, that's also the, uh, the cause for the native Americans, uh, to, to have uh, darker skin because of their, uh, unwillingness to repent, um, uh, and, and why the, uh, the Lamanites and Nephites would, uh, would go to war with each other, uh, so that they could be properly distinguished. The Lamanites who were the bad guys, uh, got, uh, got cursed with dark skin. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I, the so basically the being having born with dark skin or born into a family of dark skin means that you're already you're already cursed according to mormonism and therefore you already uh that was your fault and therefore if, if for anybody who is uh, uh in in a lower class and happens to have black skin according to mormonism it is their fault um uh and not from anything that they've done here in this life um but uh I, I feel like there's a huge chunk of something that i've said before on that and i'm i'm losing it right now also that okay I well i can know. throw a couple of quotes at you i hit, hit it uh yeah and come on now lds folks everybody knows that racism is not right racism is not right it's not of the holy spirit it's of the devil and we are to discern the spirit behind doctrines and if you don't know the book of job from the book of job this is wrong there's a demonic spirit behind this kind of blatant racism and this is something that you know lds people there's a lot of them you're just most of them are just nice folks you don't want to be racist, and this is wrong. You need to examine the underpinning of that which you're trusting your soul to. Now, let's just see if the things that Eric said here are true, and let's just read one quote from Joseph Smith, and we'll read you one quote also uh, from Brigham Young. Joseph Smith wrote, There is a reason why one man is born black and with other disadvantages 
while another is born white with great advantages. The reason is that we once had an estate before we came here. We were obedient, more or less, to the laws that were given us there. Those who were faithful in all things there received greater blessings here, and those who were not faithful received less. There were no neutrals in the war in heaven. All took sides, either with Christ or with Satan. Every man had his agency there, and men received rewards here based on their actions there, just as they will receive rewards hereafter for deeds done in the body. The Negro evidently is receiving the reward he merits. How can any of you LDS folks defend that as the truth of God? It obviously is not. We'll read something here from Brigham Young. Brigham Young and Joseph Smith being the two principal figures in LDS. Uh, Brigham Young said this, Blacks are uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, and low in their habits, wild and seemingly without the blessings of the intelligence that is generally bestowed upon mankind. This is Journal of Discourses, chapter 7, page uh, 290. Now, I, you know, Eric said at the outset that we do not want to just destroy Mormonism without giving you some place to go. And there is some place to go to the real Jesus who was sent by the real Father to, to give us the real word of God. You can repent and believe the true gospel of the true Jesus Christ. And you can come out of this error by just repent and believe the gospel. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus died upon the cross for you. You do have a place to go, and that's to come home to Jesus, the real one. The, uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't, this, uh, I don't know, this, the racism thing, I, it just, that, that clearly that's, that, I don't know, it's harsh. Like, it, and it, and it clearly, you know, even, you know, I, I'm all for it, even if it's not popular, if it's true, speak it. That clearly doesn't even add up to how I, I, I'm just, it's one of those things I'm at a loss for words on. I don't even know how to. It's indefensible. Right. How could anybody with a logical mind say, oh, this is the truth of God. Let's defend that. Yeah, it's indefensible. Yeah. It's it's an obvious fly, and our our LDS friends should realize that. You need to jump off the boat. These men are not worthy of you trusting your eternal souls to. And and I think that many of them do understand that it's wrong. Hence why. So um, up until the uh, the civil rights movement, actually, um, uh, uh, those of uh, darker skin descent. Uh, were not allowed to hold the priesthood, and they were banned from holding the priesthood, according to uh, the Mormon priesthood, until um, all uh, everybody who was of white descent who was going to be there is able to be there. Um, that was that was uh, initially what was put forward, and then in the civil rights movement, God apparently changed his mind um, to where, uh, oh, oh, okay, now. Uh, uh, now we're not going to be racially divided on that. Everybody can come to the priesthood. Well, theologically speaking, if that were to be the case, then uh, that would mean that all y'all, all white folks are no longer allowed to be in the priesthood. I don't know how to work with that one, considering that the majority of the priesthood is still white. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if just understand that any, anybody white nowadays who's in the holding that priesthood uh, really shouldn't, according to Mormonism, be holding that anymore. Um but uh, but yeah, they would say their official position on that uh, was was changed back in the uh, uh, I don't know seventies, sixties, somewhere in there. Could You'd I... have to have a little cognitive dissonance there to sort that out, wouldn't you? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Could go, I go could ahead, I interject, Brian. Could I interject about the yes, dark sir. skin? So I'll, I'll. This is kind of a. It's not really a theory. I've looked at it. There's some uh, locations in my home state of Kentucky um, that talk about 
Indians and a warrior's path. I've mentioned it on different broadcasts I've done in the past, but it hits right along with what Eric's talking about. Uh, red skin, dark skin, brown skin. Here's a newsflash. Ancient Egypt. We're talking about Joseph Smith finding two golden, supposedly, tablets of some shape or form using an angel, or an angel used a hymn to find them in an Indian mound. And to be able to depict it, he had to use a seer stone, and then it reformed from the Egyptian language. Well, there's a sign in literally just about 40 minutes away from me that talks about the warrior's path, and it's called the Indian Old Fields. It means Eskapakakiki. Eskapakakiki is an Indian term for kintake. But when you look at it in Greek, ancient Greek, it's konvoki. So konvoki means Nubian warrior. The Nubian warriors come from ancient Egypt. Why is the connection of Egyptian of anything of Egyptian Egyptology or any kind of artifacts or sarcophaguses or anything? And why in Manchester, New York, you got a the two golden tablets that derive from Egyptian hieroglyphics. And why do in Kentucky I have evidence of Nubian warriors? Red skin, dark skin, brown skin. That was way back before Joseph Smith come around. I'm just letting everybody know. So there's something diabolical going on with the principalities, the wickedness. We're talking about angelic fallen angels, manipulation of man and, and, and deterring man to, to do their will, so to speak. So that's just how I just want to throw it in there. Because the Nubian, the Nubian connection with ancient Egypt, so it just it baffles the mind. Because there's plenty, plenty, plenty of data that there was uh, black, red, and brown skin in America way before Columbus came around, way before any of those. I mean, thousands of years ago, and uh, it derives back from ancient. It, it goes right back. That's why we have the Grand Canyon, all these different things with the Egyptian artifacts. But now, but wait, in the 21st century, we just we just brush underneath the rug and just ignore it, like it doesn't exist or something. But that's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, and it, it is just absolutely true. And it's so provable that uh, the the black-skinned Olmecs were here way before what the, what the line from the secular institutions would tell us that only fairly recently that people with black skin were brought over as slaves and that they have always been subservient. Well, in truth we can see that the Olmec culture was the mother culture of the Mayans and the Incas. And just so many of these things fold right in here with their study on Mormonism. And Brian, if you've got that, if you want to pull up that Google Earth and show us some of that imagery there of the oh. Hilkumara, we'll get the understanding that there, it's not just like one Indian mound. We've got a an, an ancient worship center an ancient worship center, which would lead even to more credibility that Joseph Smith did find something there. Absolutely, David. I can do that real quick. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's just very interesting uh, site. Uh, and then um, here we go. So what we're looking at here, I, I'm big into Google Earth. I love looking at, um, if anybody's new to FOJC Rumble or Visual Disturbance Channel or anything that we've done, you know, was supposed, you know, I've done a lot of different broadcasts with other different uh, Dan Madoni, everybody else, John Hall. Um, the sacred, so people get into ley line narrative, the sacred uh, lines. There's there's evidence of this, and like David said, this whole area is inundated. We showed you all pictures earlier with slides. Now we're actually going to show you a little bit of a 3D kind of narrative. But we're going to get down the land, and then there's an aerial view. But apparently, the hill of Kumara is right here. And I was uh, showing David this earlier. When you go to look at this, supposedly where he dug up the lovely go plates that we've been talking about during the broadcast, if you go and look at this right here, and I'll do that a little bit of a get a little bit of visual here, I could not believe. Well, it's a little blurry here. One moment, we'll get us a different angle here in a second. But as you can see, here we are with a obulus. So we got a cephalic, and we got this golden creature, or creature, excuse me, golden angel on the top, but it doesn't have a trumpet. It doesn't have a trumpet, doesn't have a horn. Uh, it's kind of interesting how it's in a circle formation base, and then you have, there's all these different 
depictions of gathering people gathering but there is one earlier i will show you this that it actually showed the joseph smith i just didn't hit the right one um one moment it might be this one one second let me go here it might have been the same one i just did but it um it'll actually show you joseph smith uh literally well, that's the wrong one forgive me you all but one second it has it has to be this one right here let's go to this one they change periodically so it's hard to well anyways it's this one right here you can't really see it on here that well but this is supposedly i think the uh angel that we've been referring to of uh, morana and uh and moroni i mean and then you got joseph smith here and then but you have this golden once again a golden angel pointing up the fingers are pointing up but it's an obelus but if you look at it and you kind of zoom back out in the aerial view footage of it and i'm always about these ley lines uh there's a huge direct connection with the ley lines it's that it's not even that far in proximity of the area which is so cool uh me and david was talking about that today um i'll show you the distancing on it with the mileage here so you can literally go to mileage on it one moment there's the miles and then there's the uh where we just got done presenting it's literally like two miles two and a half miles in proximity that way and then you can kind of zoom out and then it does the exact same thing there's ley lines everywhere it's like nine miles out and it's it's right it's pretty centered in between two ley lines i mean it's pretty pretty baffling but when you go back in this is what i was showing david earlier you have all this this vast it's a, it, you can't really see it. It's kind of flat, but it's all this tree. There's forestry around everywhere. But there's they've even made a little lovely sidewalk, and you know they're basically a place to go visit this and worship technically. If you want to get into you know into that, but one moment, let me get into here. This is what blew my mind and was so compelling. I have to show it here. I don't even know what this is. I just had looked at this earlier. There's all this ancient looking. It just all designs i don't know if it's a megalithic structure but as you can see right up here at the top is where we just come from with the obelisk on top of the mountain or on top of the mound but all this right here they have this supposedly little you know it's walled it's walled off you know so that i guess so nobody can get in there but i don't know what this is but i know this has to do something with the kumara i think it has you know it's a, it's very evident that there's something to it because it's a really there's stairways going up but then that's where the supposedly, you know, jo uh, Joseph Smith uh, was able to excavate those tablets. Well, if you turn around here and look, there's a tent. And there's all these flags. But if you go up, if you go back to the aerial view, it almost looks like there's a fencing here. And to me, this looks like staging. I don't know if they have outings or events here, concerts, etc., whatever they have, any kind of venue. But I always do this when I look at stuff, especially on my Visual Disturbance channel. I look for like anything, anything with harmonization to harmonics, frequency, crowds, you know, something to that effect that it's generating if there's a large amount of people there. So this one was blowing my mind because you have this so-called looking ruins of something, temple or whatever it is, and you have this just not even from just a couple yards away or less, a couple hundred feet or just a couple 30, 40 feet away. You have this stadium-looking seating, I guess, that they have large crowds. But then you go up, and there's the the Hill of Kumara on top. And then if you zoom back out, it even gets even weirder. I mean, you go across the street, and there's all these weird designs. If uh, So many weird designs. I don't know if they're... It looks like a megalithic, uh, ancient... I mean, there's all kinds. I don't know if... You know, a lot of people would look at me like, What are you talking about, Brian? It looks like somebody's mowing. But if you see the impressions on the ground, and you go out here... And look at this. There's this snake trail. It's uh, I don't know if there's construction. I don't know what's going on here, but it it really looks like a complex of an ancient. You know, there's indentions here. Let me see. There's indentions like right around here, and um, there's impressions on the ground. This has to be an ancient uh, site, way before Joseph Smith came around, way before he even came around in this existence in the 1800s. There's all kinds of bizarro. It's probably just, you know, obviously there's probably, they're tilling the ground, cutting it and all that. I get it. But uh, I would say, I'm going to look more into it um, after this broadcast. I say some of these areas, this especially this circle formation where they got tracks running around it, this is probably trees. They usually have mounds, right? There's mounds always being uh, covered up with trees. They've done that back way back. They did the same thing in Machu Picchu in Peru. 
uh, just to try to keep uh, the locals and the citizens away from it. But I just thought it was so interesting. This kind of looks like a construction site here. Just ignore that one. But um, this area is so, so bizarre and the growing of the trees all around it. But then you can get a good perspective when you zoom, when you go to this location. Like, I, let's just go right here, for example. I'm going to go at the very top. Let's get a little bit more. Uh, I don't know what they're building here. I know it looks kind of, this looks new, but then if you look at the the uh, structures on the side, who builds something like this? In the, you know, I don't know if they've been adding on. I think what they've done is they put a platform here for people to be able to walk and to uh, observe. But if you can look, there's this ancient megalithic structures and hieroglyphic looking type of Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, architect work here. And I think they're trying to refurbish and put stairways up to make this safe for people. But as you can see, there it is. So this is a better view. These are seats. See how they have chairs here? And this is going to be like some type of stage. And they're going to be literally coming here and sitting in chairs. And here's this so-called stage. But it looks like an ancient walkway to a pyramid. But then at the very top here is where the obelisk was, where Joseph Smith was up on top of the peak, you know, I guess when the angel told him to go get the golden tablets, one would wonder if there's something very significant going on here, in my opinion. But uh, yeah. I just want to show it. What do you think, David and Eric? Well, and I know I looked was looking this evening at a drawing of the Hill Kamara in the 1800s, and there were two other mounds there. And I don't know whether they're still there and are hidden by the woods or if they've been torn down. But uh, I, it does look like the overall picture. I think there's probably a lot we could learn with the little careful observation of the landscape there. What, what's your take on that, Eric? I'm actually learning all this for the first time right now. I just uh, I know the general story and uh, things just seem to match up with some of the other things we've been uh, uncovering. And uh, hey, you're taking it. That's well, that's. What you're seeing is I'm I'm you're presenting it to me for the first time too. I and I'm I'm I don't I'm, I have no words right now. Well, the the seating arrangement and they're proclaiming whatever they're going to be gathering there for. Like I've said before, they use these ancient sites for yep. gatherings to literally increase. I, I think it has to do with the crowds. The more people that come, yep. the more type of worship. Yeah, the more the more you know it, it gathers. I know this is going to sound strange. I think this the the energy levels and everything, and it and it you know you're giving back worship to this angel of Morona. I think that that's. I mean, I really do think that that's way. I it's nothing like, less than that. So, yeah. uh, one one thing I do, the one thing that is coming to mind is um, uh, many. Many people, Catholics, Mormons, uh, many others that, uh, uh, that that would at least profess or at least say that the Bible is uh, is important to them. Um, one thing that they tend to overlook, um, if you ask a Catholic, do you worship Mary? They're going to say no, but clearly they do. Uh and, and, and it's it's they they would refer to it as we are venerating or we are we are given reverence to we are revering mm -hmm. um uh and what they uh, what many people can have a tendency of doing is is they don't even realize that their their veneration their their revering is actually becoming worship it is worship and so if a bunch of people were to be coming to here into this site right here that you're showing um they're they're it, they're going to be revering something and it is clearly not of God. And I can clearly see, I can see where you're going here with this, this, this dark angel Moroni is, is the, is the image bearer there, if you would. Um, and I would also like to point out that uh, uh, the LDS church Mormons, the Mormonism doesn't have any problem being compared in many ways to uh to Freemasonry, and so in some ways, uh, uh, there is there are apologists, Mormon legitimate apologists, who will actually defend their imagery, saying that, uh, oh yeah, this dark image right here, it's just because they got it from the same source we we did, and uh, uh, and it, going back to uh, the Temple of Solomon, 
uh, they're going to say. And and in some cases, they could trace it back to the Tower of Babel. And I'm like, these are not exactly, that, that, that doesn't exactly, there was a dark period of Solomon's time. Uh, clearly, the Tower of Babel was not a good thing. And you're you're tracing it back, like like there's, uh, there's some who are pointing out to, uh, oh, look at all this, uh, um, uh, oh, Philistines? No, not the Philistines. The, uh, come on. Who? The Canaanites? Nah, almost. Uh, the, uh, they're on ships. Philistines. Was it the Philistines? I thought it was. Uh, I Philistines are the, I, I don't know. That, anywho, there's evidence of the, um, the Philistines. I, we'll go with it. Uh, who have come to America and that that archaeological evidence has been pulled up and people are associating that with uh, and there is there are actual Mormon Phoenicians. Th- that's it Phoenicians. Phoenicians. thank go. you um uh, Phoenician ships uh and and look at them they're all coming to America and then they're associating that with the uh with the Nephites or the Lamanites and uh, well like same thing but they're associating that with that story and look at this this matches up with that and and I'm like these are not exactly good guys in history, and you're you're but you're painting them as if they are, um, and that 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 there lies right there. It's it's more connections that is going to validate the Book of Mormon at some point, validate the stories, and in in some ways it's going to validate and it's going to give credibility to uh, to Freemasonry to some people, um, and and that's that's you're seeing an obelisk you're seeing the egyptian symbolism you're seeing the masonic symbolism and i say spot on right on and then one thing i want to throw in there too is the lake ontario is only 20 miles away from this location i just looked at it sorry david forgive me but uh, only 20 20 miles from lake ontario that's all it is so now i want to tell everyone in the chat if you have a question for eric get your question to brian there and I'm going to throw out another topic here to Eric. And after that, if there's any questions, um, Eric can address them here. But I wanted to ask Eric about another really bizarre element of the LDS faith, and that is the baptism for the dead. No. Uh, okay. Well, <clears throat> so you want to talk about an element of worship. The... Uh, Okay. Now, what brings a curse onto a particular land, or onto a particular area, onto a particular person or a group of people ultimately is sin, right? Uh, sin done by someone, sin done against somebody. Uh, if there is not repentance, if there is not forgiveness uh, through Christ Jesus, there, there is a curse that comes with that sin. Um, it is one of the primary effects. And, uh, and, and, demonic entities can latch on to that curse and uh and 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 over time that's where you know an area person you know there, there needs to be some form of deliverance by the blood of jesus amen um the uh the interesting thing about the baptisms for the dead and here's a big warning uh for anybody who is who has done this like understand what is being done According to Mormonism, you go into the temple, and because you are now in a position to do temple work, the uh, the the LDS faith says that there was nobody who could have been saved in between the time of the apostles to the time of Joseph Smith, and therefore everybody during that time frame is allegedly lost, according to the story, unless somebody within the Mormon faith goes back through their genealogy and other people's genealogy and is able to be baptized in place of this dead individual. Well, for one, that's certain to sound like veneration for the dead, which I, I, I think there's uh, some pretty strong commandments about that in the, uh, in the scriptures, but the, uh, uh, but to continue on what this, what, what the individual Mormon is doing is they are, going back and they are taking the sins of that individual upon their own actions, what they are doing in a way they are acting, they're they're acting in place of Christ from their perspective. So not only are they stepping in and actually like 
claiming to do what Jesus does. They are, in the name of Jesus, taking those sins upon themselves. I, I, again, I don't want a Mormon bash, and I want an individual bash. But I would like to point out that uh, that there, the that if you look at um, uh, psychological anxiety, if you want to look at this, the statistics when it comes down to medical issues psychologically, you're going to find actually the majority of them within the United States actually home in around the Utah area. Is it possible? And I'm just posing the question for thought is it possible that what these individuals are doing are actually it's not just fairy tales it's not just stories but it's actually a ritual involved to where they are actually taking the curses if you if you think about the past 2000 years of human history roughly the past 2000 years all over the world there's a whole lot of different type of people a whole lot of different cultures a whole lot of different kinds of sin a whole lot of different uh, uh, gods involved there that are being revered and then not revered in some cases have died off in, in some ways forgotten in history but each individual it, what's happening here is that's that's taking the curse is it taking the curse of that sin and inviting it into the home of that individual Mormon now maybe not into the it, it, yes into the home but then a, on a larger scale is it is it bringing that energy to a particular geographical area to 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 gods that would have based uh, upon their uh the, the, their reverence uh, they would they would be, have some uh authority over there in ancient wherever that's not even america but now you're giving them veneration here specifically maybe the largest population in the utah area maybe even the, into the salt lake area or utah county area which is in just another valley are these valleys bringing this energy in in order to empower something that otherwise wouldn't be there or that has been there so ancient and forgotten about that it's it's got it's given that uh uh some sort of uh uh worship what's uh and, and basically taking all the curses of those individuals and taking it upon themselves I, I strongly advise any Mormon who has gone through this to uh, to repent and get out. You you are not in you are you are in a da extra dangerous spot when you are trying to be Jesus to someone else in any way, even if they're dead. That's ooey. Um. I feel like there was another point. The well, I was thinking of that, and I lost it again. Well, I want to big, give a big amen to Eric is spot on there and our LDS friends. There is forgiveness and cleansing in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the one that can cleanse from sin. Amen. And I believe also he is so spot on. They're feeding on earth energies. You can see the whole concept there in the layout with the hill Kumara, the, the understanding of the mounds, the earth energies and the bringing up the powers from the underworld, I think all of these things are coming into play to make that area in Salt Lake City one of the most spiritually toxic areas in the world. I absolutely believe that. Now, Brian, if you can throw up that scripture and uh, a couple of quotes there, I'm going to give the people a little bit of historical background of just what this baptism for the dead is is all about and i'll read the scripture here in first corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29 and this is the text that the mormons wrongly interpret for this premise of the baptism of the dead uh in first corinthians 15 29 else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all why are they then baptized for the dead? And the church at Corinth, as we know, boy, that was the problem, church. All kinds of problems going on in Corinth. There were people there that were baptizing for the dead, and there were also people there denying the resurrection. It was crazy time. 
And Paul was just kind of, you know, barbing them a little. You know, if the dead don't rise, why are you baptizing for the dead? It was just cognitive dissonance of the third degree. But let's go back in history and let's get the historical precedence of this practice. And this is going to link. We've already seen links with the Mormon doctrine, the Book of Mormon, the Mormon organization with Egyptian and uh, terrible fallen angel cultures. But we're going to read from John Chrysostom. This book is entitled The Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers. John Chrysostom lived from 347 A.D. to 407 A.D. And in his 40th homily on 1 Corinthians, this is what Mr. Chrysostom said. It said, Or will ye that I should first mention how they who are infected with the Marcionite heresy, pervert this expression. Now, Marcion was one of the heads of the one of the most popular ancient Gnostic school, and Marcion was one that uh, the dispensationalists go along. He said that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament were two different gods, and this certainly falls in with dispensationalism and also, unfortunately, with LDS. He goes on to say, and I know indeed that I shall excite much laughter. Nevertheless, even on this account, most of all, I will mention it, that you may the more completely avoid this disease. And Mr. Chrysostom called it a disease. And it's linked not only with the Gnostic Marcion, but it is also linked with the Gnostic Serentius. And I'll read just a quick snippet from Linsky's commentary, and he comments, he says, a specific name was invented for this sort of baptism. It was called vicarious baptism. In support of this supposition, we are referred to the reports of Tertullian, Epiphanius, and Chrysostom regarding such perversions of baptism among the followers of Serentius and Marcion, both heads of ancient Gnostic schools. So this is coming not from the word of God. This is coming straight out of Gnosticism. Mr. Olinsky goes on to say, what happens among these heretics is carried back across the years to Corinth in order to explain a preposition which complicates the efforts of these interpreters. It is needless to say that the New Testament knows nothing about vicarious baptism, and that if Paul had discovered the beginning of, of such a perversion in Corinth, he would have opposed it in no uncertain terms. And this is just uh, another one of the con clear connections with the LDS faith and Gnosticism and the fallen angel Gnos Gnosis and the Genesis 6 worship. Now, are there any questions out there uh, for Eric, Brian? I did uh, I did put his email in the chat, Eric, so everybody can contact you. I did place it in the chat. And then toward the end of the video, I will put the email in the description below if you have any more further questions for Eric. But I have not seen anybody. Uh, type it in capitalized letters. All right. So we can see it, everybody. And if you have any All questions, right. I we'll... know we got a, a good, good, lively chat. Mm -hmm. So sure do. if you do find and if you don't find, I know Eric's doing a good job of covering the material. And something else I want uh, Eric to talk about here a little bit is the idea. And this is another something that just makes my skin crawl. The idea that this Mormon God had sexual intercourse with oh. Mary to impregnate her. That just is blasphemous. They need to stop that. And anybody, I mean, they just need to stop. So uh, I, I would like to point out that uh, that a God it, would not need a, a, an angel, I could see, right? An angel coming down, another created being, would have to have intercourse with another created being in order to have a uh, 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 well a demigod 
or a Nephilim or something of the sort, right? The um, uh, the idea that, uh, yeah, Elohim, according to Mormon story, would have had to come down and, and, and have sex with Mary in order to produce Jesus is is just well she is one of his daughters for one to put it in that perspective according to that story um so in order to do that that that's what he has to do um th this goes beyond supporting polygamy this goes into uh supporting um I, I don't even you get the idea um I'm just I, I don't know where else to go with that one that's uh to point out the uh the the file problem with that is is just like it's one of them type of things if you have to explain to someone why that's wrong it almost ruins it they, they, all right thank you i, I, I mean you I know, know i mean graphic i need to go into that but yeah that's uh shame on you if you believe that shame on you repent repent and something I in that I thought of there in the beginning of this cartoon, when it talked about how Jesus was chosen to be the savior of this world. Right. And we got trillions of planets. This, to me, brought in the Vatican uh, concept of the other saviors on other planets. Right. And when they get here, we can baptize them into Catholicism. And this is the kind that, of portrays to me the same concept here yeah and that mindset uh even more so reduces jesus even more than he already is in these stories that's uh, that like it, jesus is somehow even lesser when you start talking about this world versus that world and however many worlds and all of a sudden like oh he's just just for those guys over there like yeah. like like okay so then he's just him over there right so much for you know it, that 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 is not the real Jesus. The real Jesus no. is 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 the name of above all, above all names. He is uh, he is the King of Kings. It reminds me also of Ar the Archons. You're talking about these other planets and all this stuff. That's that's been coming back up in the um, UFO world and everything. And they're they're looking for a savior, but they're not looking for Jesus. And uh, they'll latch on to anything. I mean. I mean, my goodness, uh, the angel Morana, if, if he shows back up, I mean, you know, what I'm saying? you get what I mean? I mean, people's going to just oh, yeah. bow to it. it. You know, it's not going to be Jesus they're bowing to, you know. It, and I think, I really do think this is how they're able to find archaeology sites and everything. There's just no way we don't have any kind of technology. We've got sonar and all these different things, but you can look on the uh, Skinwalker Ranch. The guys have high advanced technology. They can barely scratch the surface on what's going on over there at that mesa. And you mean tell me back in the day, old Joseph Smith just walking around, I'm going to go in my backyard because there's an angel guiding me, and he's telling me what to do. I'm Look, it's a, it's bizarre. It's a bizarre world. Yeah, it's just well, a bizarre there's... world. Uh, the two things I'd like to point out: if the Dark Angel Moroni happens to show up again at any point, I'd like to uh, say that the um, uh, the earthquakes we had shortly after, um, well, I think it was in 2020, um, the uh, uh, the trumpet at the main Salt Lake Temple, the trumpet in the hand of Moroni was knocked out of his hand. Um, and uh, going back a few years before I moved to Utah, I don't know how far back, but I. I do know at some point so there was the west jordan temple and uh i heard the story that lightning had struck that moroni statue and actually blackened it they had to take a few years shortly after it was dedicated it was just dedicated and it was lightning struck it and uh and blackened it and they had to replace that i don't know if that's just that, that would tell me something that would at least hint to something like yeah. you know but um uh, th this idea that uh, uh, an angel coming to somebody and telling them the story, this is not the first time this has happened. Um, the exact same story. You, you, you take the person or take the name out of it, take the culture out of it, and you could find the exact same story done with a Middle Eastern character in about roughly the, I don't know, third, fourth, sixth century, somewhere in there, um, commonly usually known as uh, Muhammad. Uh, who eventually wrote the Quran, and he said he had an angel that came to him as well. And that angel came to him saying that the scriptures 
as we know it, uh, uh, have become corrupted. Uh, you cannot trust the Jewish writings or the Christian writings. And let me, Mr. Angel, give you uh, the the true word of God. And in both these cases, an angel is coming and telling to him. And I, you know what? I, I don't recall anywhere in the, correct me if I'm wrong, David, I can't think of a single biblical scripture where it's claimed that an angel just hung out with a guy for this whole time and 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 wrote this stuff now and, and and but interestingly enough it 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 takes the message and and takes it in a completely different direction like it it changes the god into some other uh uh god who is who is becoming less becoming lesser it, it, I'm, I'm starting to notice this as i'm saying it right there that i mean uh, allah is is really a a re-emerging of like a, a moon goddess isn't it like a, yeah yeah um and so i'm trying to see and i'm, I'm seeing now that uh you know it was there a dying off deity in the 1800s that may have been revived as a result of the rise of mormonism maybe i don't know i'm, I'm just seeing that just as we were talking here um but uh uh but it's certainly given reverence to something um and i i do see the connection in some way shape or form i know that the uh the euphrates is dying drying up but i know a lot of other areas are drying up the salt lake itself is drying up the actual great salt lake um uh what's going to be coming out i don't know could that be one of the valleys of the earth uh mentioned in uh the book of enoch that uh the angels were were imprisoned to i don't know maybe um just putting these thoughts out there to chew on a little bit but um one of the aspects that would certainly be worthy of more attention in the future is the fact that and i and i i i, I don't see this say this with any pleasure at all but when things get really really bad i mean real bad uh like the grocery stores empty bad our evangelical Christian friends, a high percentage of them are going to die. They don't believe in prepping. They're waiting for a pre-tribulation rapture to take them out of the world before it gets too tough. A very high percentage of those folks are going to die. And I hate that. We do everything we can to try to warn people to avert that fact. But it's also true that a very high percentage of Mormon people will survive. They're preppers. They're going to be here. And we're going to see right now, we're seeing a tremendous surge in power in the LDS church. This is certainly going to escalate. And also something I picked up on in, in this, um, in the little cartoon was the fact that Jesus had three wives and the fact that Joseph Smith claimed to be a descendant of Jesus Christ. Right. These people are going to be able to blend in with uh, the European bloodlines that believe that they also are of the Despacini and the whole Da Vinci Code thing, they're going to fit right in and fold in with them just like a glove. To, to add to that, the uh, not only would he, does he claim to be a descendant of Jesus, uh, he would go back as far as to say, I, and I don't know how this works considering that Jesus is a descendant of uh, 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 Judah, but Joseph also claims to be a descendant of joseph of the uh the, the one of the uh the uh, from egypt um and and interestingly enough to show the narcissistic aspect of this the um the joseph in egypt where his 12 12 brothers sold him into or his 10 brothers sold him into slavery um the uh the, the, that joseph was actually named after the joseph smith that would once be in the supposed end times. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they need to stop that. The, 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 the Joseph of, so what I, the point that I was getting at to is, is that that Joseph ties back to Egypt. There I don't go. know where that connects with, but that Egyptian also brings hieroglyphics. Now Egyptian, Egyptian yeah. hieroglyphics. There you go. Yeah, that's it, could what, be a, it could be a bloodline really, thing. It could be the angels was literally monitoring these individuals for precise times to, to move and shake it even if it's 2000 3000 years difference hundreds of years difference 
it you know moving and hey here's this and this plot and of land dig it and take your take and build a book off of it <laughs> yeah take and build yeah. a religion off of it worship the angels don't worship jesus <laughs> i mean it's it's that's just straight, straight up i mean that's all i'm hearing that's what i'm observing and listening to you guys conversation yeah is to divert away from christ and uh it's insane uh question eric there was questions in the chat did uh have you did you practice mormonism uh me myself no i've uh I, I dove right in when i learned that i was moving to utah um and i just tried to learn as much as i could as quickly as i could i can say that i haven't uh uh i i've looked i've been around enough people of mormonism with respect to them and them respect to me and they fully understand my position that the uh uh so i haven't uh gone in mormon bashing too hard but to a point to where i i've tried uh uh, tried gaining from them as least as far as knowledge and i tried uh witnessing as much as i could for uh thinking it through too and then another so. question while we're on the questions here one more question mormons do they why does mormons not uh do not allow crosses why does why does mormons do they they don't, they don't allow crosses do you know uh, that's a uh, actually one that i was recently about to question myself and dive into i i um the uh it it really is not much not as hot much of a significant um point in history as far as their theology is concerned um jesus's uh life and his resurrection in a sense or is uh, is more sig is not not so much the resurrection the ascension his life and ascension, interestingly enough, ascended master kind of thing, is actually more uh, uh, relevant to their theology than the death and resurrection. Um, mm -hmm. That is my off the top of my head, and so therefore that I, I that is something that I can certainly um, I, I would encourage somebody to probably I don't take my word one hundred percent for it at this moment. Is what I'm saying. That's why I was saying earlier, the whole ascension, the ascended masters is a very, 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 very dangerous doctrine, severe dangerous. And it goes along with what we're talking about tonight. It really does. Promising the earth, you get a different earth and or a different planet to roam on and build and have billions of, you know, you're, you get this special underwear and all this different stuff. I mean, we got a cartoon, another cartoon to show the brought, you know, show the chat and everybody in the chat. Um, they just about, I can't even, I, I just can't process it. It doesn't even register with me. I'm not trying to mock you, anybody or anything. It's just, it makes me sad. <laughs> really, uh, I'll leave it to you, Brian. You, you've seen that. I don't know. Dude, would you, uh, um, would it be appropriate to, uh, to show that right here? I think to show what, Eric? There, there was, an, was one more of the quick cartoon that I oh, uh, throw sure, Brian to sure. today. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't know if that's uh, yeah. Let's yeah. Um, I, I forgot about it that. It kind of hits on some of the uh, same subject, but it opens up another area. It is a little bit more um, doubt. This um, uh, I, I, I should Brian. Are you able to pull it up? Yeah, give me like two seconds. Okay, sounds good. Two seconds. Um, and, yeah. So there's uh there's there's really only two videos put out by this. Uh, I don't remember who exactly it was that put it out there, but. Oh, ex Mormon something or other. Uh, they, they're another their their other video, which I'm I'm thinking Brian would put it in the chat is uh, is really it, it's a good, good solid amount going through all the historical references to the racist comments of all the different various presidents and uh, 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 church leaders throughout um, throughout the past couple hundred years regarding. So it it. it they really, really, really hit it hard for a while, yeah. Until they say God changed his mind. Yeah, I have the I have the cartoon up. If you want me to proceed, and uh, it's uh, what four minutes, a little bit over four minutes long. Would you like for me to play it, Eric? I say go for it. All righty then. Give me one second.
Hello? We're representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mormons. Our prophets have sent us to deliver a message given from God. Prophets? Message? Yes. We're here to tell you that God appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith in 1820, and he chose Joseph to restore the truth. He did. Yes, God told him Christianity had become completely corrupt. So, you guys aren't Christians then? Oh heavens, yes, we're Christians. After all, the name of our religion is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But you just said Christianity was all wrong. It is, but because of Joseph Smith, we know ours is the only true church on the earth. So, what's so bad about Christianity? Well, you see, everything you know about God is basically wrong. First of all, God is not a spirit. He's a perfected man with a glorified body of flesh. Huh? We believe a long, long time ago, on a planet far, far away, our God, Heavenly Father, was just like us. He was born mortal. Eventually, his efforts were rewarded, and he was exalted to Godhood, joining the other millions of gods in the universe. Millions of other gods. Yep. Maybe even billions. Oh, that hurt. Oh, sorry. As he grew up, he worked hard at becoming perfect, just like all other gods did before him. Today, Heavenly Father lives on a distant planet. Next to the star, Kolob. He lives there with our Heavenly Mother having spirit babies. That's us. Yes, that's us. We all live there as spirits before we were born. We just don't remember. We come here to Earth to get a chance to work towards perfecting ourselves, so that we'll be worthy enough to be exalted as gods. So you're saying you're going to become a god? Well, well, yeah, I hope so. And just what do you mean by perfect yourselves? Well, we have to be completely faithful and obedient to our church and its rules. Rules? Well, just a few. Basically, just no drinking, no smoking, no gambling or swearing, no coffee. Or tea. No watching rated R movies, fornication, stealing, or lying. No shopping on Sundays. Dress modestly. Go to three hours of church every Sunday. Read the scriptures. Believe in Joseph Smith. Get baptized. Give 10% of your income to the church. Don't question the leaders. Serve in the church. And most importantly, temple, temple work. work. Temples? Is that what you call your churches? No, no. Temples are special buildings used only for secret ceremonies and rituals that are needed for godhood. So what do you do in these temples? Well, first we get anointed as kings and priests in heaven. Then we receive special holy underwear that we must wear for the rest of our lives. Uh... Special holy underwear? Yes, special because they have sacred symbols on them that give us protection. Then we're given a new name, the one that we're going to be called in heaven. Then we're taught signs and passwords called tokens. We have to memorize them to be allowed into Heavenly Father's presence. If we show the signs to the guardian angels and tell them the passwords, they might let us in. And if we've earned it, then we will become exalted as gods. And can start creating and populating our own worlds. So just what is the secret sign and password? We, we, we can't tell you. We swear oaths not to talk about them. So they're secret? No, no, they're sacred. But you can't tell me? Right. Then that's a secret. Well, fine, it's a sacred secret. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is the only people who become gods are Mormons. What about everyone else who died hundreds of years before your temples were even built? Well, that's the best part. We do all of the ceremonies on behalf of those dead people, so it will count for them in the afterlife. Yeah, we get baptized for the dead, do the signs and passwords for the dead, and even do marriage ceremonies for the dead. Did I say something wrong? Sorry about that. Yeah, so that video was just as good as the first one as far as, uh, yeah. So you can't make this stuff up. It, um, I've had people come up like that to my door in the past, and especially when I was a little bit younger, and uh, try to explain to me their theology. And um, I don't know. I pray for these people. Um and I, you know, we we've done a really good job tonight to describe, you know, describing it that it's this is it could be very dangerous to somebody's walk as seriously as a Christian and to hear these things and and what these people are propagating. I I pray for these people seriously. I really do truly pray for these people that they turn from these these ways. And that video, even though it's a little a little quirky cartoon, I think it's really well done, really well done. And um, but yeah, gentlemen. Uh, 
I muted you for a sec. Well, I accidentally got, I accidentally muted you. So you're back. So praise God. I'm glad to see you huh? back. So if you all want to comment on that video. Well, the, um, uh, I, I'd like to point out that I, we, we all have a tendency of, um, it's usually coming at an inconvenient time. I, unfortunately, I say unfortunately. Unfortunately for me, I've been, uh, I think, blacklisted by the uh, Mormon LDS missionaries um, to where if uh, any place that I lived within two weeks, they're not, they they will not come anywhere near my house anymore. Um, but I got no problem inviting them in and having conversations with them. I think what gets them the most is when you're just willing to sit there and have a conversation with them. Most of them are just kids just trying to go through their uh, their their family rituals, if you would, They're just going through and trying to do what's right and and through the uh, their their, their um, ritual uh, rites of passage, if you would. Um, it's more customary, and and in some cases, there are many missionaries who have actually walked away, really questioning things, and have that has caused good and bad effects um uh they they if the right person catches their attention if the right message catches their attention uh it will it they may stop talking to you at that time you may get some argumentative senior missionaries on you at some point but understand that uh those kids it that that message will not go on un, uh unused um, that is planting the seed, and um, and there are many missionaries who have come out of the church eventually as a result of a message that they heard properly while they were uh, while they were serving. But the negative is effect is the same too. If they're just bashed upon what's 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 ludicrous about Mormonism, and they don't have anything to turn to, well, then they just go wet, wild, crazy when they get out, and they just go into the other extreme of like, hey, I'm free to do everything. Mm -hmm. And then they go into uh, just religion hating in general, and that keeps them even further away from knowing the true Jesus. What I can't understand is the forever, and, I, and I'm trying, this is going to come off really sarcastic, the forever underwear that you have to wear. I just, that one just got me. That one got me. I can't even get over that. I'm not trying to be comical here. <laughs> that Seriously, I know it's kind of funny and humorous, but I'm really not. I couldn't imagine, have, I just couldn't imagine wearing that all the time and then especially couldn't have caffeine me and david would be thrown out because we we coffee drinkers you know I me mean, we you know we're <laughs> thrown out of the out of the loop we're not in the club you know but the with the with the underwear that one got me that, that one got actually me. and, and yep. caffeine it's commonly misunderstood it's hot beverages oh, therefore hot beverages. soda for the most part is very much okay um the uh so so hot caffeine is 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 tend to be uh and then there's also uh if a doctor prescribes something that uh helps you stay awake and alert that um that's perfectly acceptable too wow um okay. hmm. but so so caffeine is not necessarily now some mormons will take that to the point of like okay well if coffee's diking out and soda wasn't invented yet well clearly soda is then off the table too but um i i just want to say that that's that's the coffee not company. the majority but opinion there as far as the underwear um see sex to them is solely for procreation i've heard stories of that um uh like it's it's incomprehensible to a diehard temple uh mormon family for the idea of uh, i will let's see how how Anybody and everybody's watching this, so I'll just leave it alone there. But the point is, is that those undergarments are supposed to stay on no matter what at all times. Um, even uh, at intimate times with your spouse. Um, and that is that 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 is basically your a symbol of your covering through the rest of this life and into eternity, as far as I understand it. I I, I realize that. I've never actually been in the temple. I've only uh, I've only researched as much as I can go. I know everything's a super sacred secret, um, and I just I don't know where else to uh, where else to take it anywhere. And I would invite anybody watching this in the future. Um, uh, uh, Brian's going to throw 
my email address in there. If if anybody is coming at this, viewing this from an LDS perspective, and I am in any of we're in here, we are misrepresenting. I, I'll tell you, it's unintentional. Uh, but if there's anything that needs to be cleared up, please email me. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll just say it right here. It's it's counter underscore Jesuit underscore infiltration at yahoo.com. So counter Jesuit infiltration at yahoo.com with the underscore separating the words. Um, and I, I would invite you to please, please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I would like to hear it. Um, and uh, uh, for anybody who has any questions, please hit me up also there as well. I can probably give it from a Mormon LDS perspective, what they believe as much as uh, from a biblical, here's where, so if, if anybody's wondering like, what is the Mormon belief in this or that in comparison, what where is it wrong in the Bible? Where is it incorrect in scripture? How does it counter this? So I feel free to hit me up with, to slam me on it. I, well, I'll take it. Yeah, we'll make sure I put that in the description for you. And Challenge everybody. me. Yeah, I'll make sure I put that up there when the broadcast is over. Absolutely, Eric. Um, hey, David, I got one question for you because there's uh, somebody yes, that is literally very uh, wanted, really wanted to hear you for your thoughts on this. So what's your thoughts on the Anglo-Israel thesis, a book written by Reed Benson? Your thoughts are welcomed. I am not familiar with that particular title, but the I could speak to the basic theory of Anglo-Israelism as was espoused by Herbert Armstrong, basically being that the uh, white race is the lost tribes of Israel. I do not believe that. I totally reject that premise. Hmm. But I want to thank everyone. We're winding down our broadcast here. I want to really thank um, Eric and Brian for all of their work to make this broadcast possible. And I, as we're winding down here, if uh, I'm so thankful to be able to present this broadcast on Mormonism, it needs to be talked about a lot more. It's something that's going to be looming greater and greater importance as we go forward. And if you in the chat, if you would like to hear another broadcast on Mormonism uh, in the near future, on Sunday Night Live, let us know. I think this is a very important topic, and um, I'm just thankful for all of the work that Brian did and Eric did to help bring this uh, information. So if that's something you'd like to see, let us know in the chat. And I want to go to um, Brian. I want to go to Eric for some final thoughts here. Uh, Brian, uh, final thoughts on the broadcast this evening. I've learned a lot and I've learned a lot today <laughs> and it's always a blessing to do this with you, David. And it's an honor. And Eric, it's an honor. We got to talk to you off air. Uh, well done, my friend. And, uh, it's a very blessing. It is. And anybody, if they're, if they're contemplating on any kind of theory or theology or horrible doctrine, the simplicity of Christ, just turn to Christ. Like it's red letters, the precious Lord, the precious words of Jesus, the parables, the whole, I mean, Matthew, Luke, John, I mean, you can get the whole Bible and just chew on it for a while. Don't, don't just push it to the side and say, well, let's go to ascended masters. Let's go to the UFO phenomenon. Literally anchor yourself to the scriptures walk away from all this secular garbage that's that's being uh promoted and and literally inundated into her face on a daily basis when it comes to all the television all the pre all the program the predicted programming it's off the charts i mean center yourself i hate to, well i shouldn't use that word but literally pray and get on your knees and pray for deliverance from these things and let the holy spirit uh drive you on the narrow path instead of this broadened path that's getting larger <laughs> but yeah, that's my last week. Yeah, last few words. Just check us out on next week. Uh, next week we're going to be doing that mud fossil video uh, broadcast, and I'm looking forward to it, David. But it's been an honor tonight to have you on, Eric, and uh, honor to do this, David. So bless you both. Mm -hmm. Amen. Final uh, thoughts, Eric. Uh, I just know that it's going to bug me on what uh, what 
topics were not said and that's the same thing and uh, and i would be like i'd like to uh echo what david said and and, and letting us know that you'd want to hear more or understanding more um except for the the fact is i'll probably not be watching any chats or comments that just so also i'd like to open it up also to just shoot me an email on those things too um saying that uh, you know can you talk more on this can you hit more on this can you this or that um and i would just like to uh to point out also that the um the biggest temptation in mormonism is the same thing it goes back to the very original one did god really say and uh he he does he knows your eyes will be opened and be like be his gods knowing good from evil you know i well yeah and oh and here's here's a uh uh here's a teaser for i guess the next time that one topic i didn't talk on too is that uh, according to mormonism mankind had to sin as in they could do no choice but to sin god set up the trap and the devil in the garden just so that people would sin and set the course in motion of the salvation plan um so little teaser for i guess the next time we get a chance to talk once again many thanks to brian reese and all of the work he did to make this broadcast possible and by the way subscribe to fojc radio rumble channel and subscribe to visual disturbance and help us to get the message of the gospel out to as many people as we can many thanks to eric for coming on and sharing his expertise and for having a heart for getting the gospel to our lds friends and that's why we're doing it for so that people in the lds church that they can know that the real jesus is just a prayer away turn to jesus before it's too late mm -hmm. so with that i want to say high five and good night everybody from fojc radio sunday night live next week mud clears mud mud fossils mud flood 8 p.m central right here high five and good night everybody <laughs>